you would join with me in welcoming our guest speaker today, John Krause. Thank you, Greg, and I want to extend a thank you to Dean Parkinson for the opportunity to come here today. I consider it an absolute honor to be able to return to the school where I attended uh, almost 32 years ago. So it's what I would like to do in part of my presentation today is take you on a time machine back about 30 years ago and let you know what it was like to sit in your shoes 30 years ago when I was at the school. I told my sons uh, when I was preparing for this presentation, I asked him a couple of questions. I said, can you remember back uh, in the days when there were slide rules? And my son said, what's that? <laughs> well, literally, when I was in my senior year in high school taking my first chemistry class, there were no calculators. Electronic calculators did not exist. We had this little wooden stick with marks on it, and it was a slide rule, and it's what we used to make calculations with. And I got my first four-function calculator, paid 100 bucks for it, in my first physics class here at BYU when I came here in 1976. So believe that 30 years ago, there were no Googles, there were no computers, there were no personal computers. That's 30 years ago. So I'm gonna take you on a little trip today down uh, memory lane a little bit for me, but I'd like to uh, start out by uh, honoring someone who, my hero. My father, Bernard Prouse, is uh, 85 years old. He was raised in Kenosha, Utah. Five generations of Prouses were all farmers and orchard raisers, and they built homes on the side. Along comes my dad as an only child, and my father, grandfather said, well, Bernard, uh, what are you going to do when you take over this farm? And my dad goes, I'm not taking over this farm. And my, dad, and my grandfather goes, well, so, Mr. Smarty Pants, what are you going to do then? And he goes, I'm going to be a PhD physicist. And my grandpa said, what's that? <laughs> But then my grandpa said, well, I don't think you're going to do that because I'm not paying for it. I don't have the money and I don't have the will to pay for it. And fortunately, my dad, through some hardship, got called into World War II, came home in one piece, married my mom, who he met in the Army in El Paso, and uh, he had the GI Bill. And he got to come here to BYU and get his, his bachelor's in physics. And then across a 10-year period of time while he was teaching in Mesquite, Nevada High School, and we lived in Bunkerville, this little town of 300 people when I was young, he worked and went to Stanford on scholarship a couple of summers, went to University of Wyoming on scholarships, finally got his master's degree. Then at 38 years old, he got a scholarship from the National Science Foundation to go to University of Utah, and he got his PhD when he was 41 years old. Now, I can't tell you the words that my grandfather used because he was kind of a colorful Utah farmer and it wouldn't be appropriate to use those words here. <laughs> but he sat there at my dad's graduation and said, by darn, he did it, he, he, he did it. And so I have my father to thank that I'm not sitting on a little farm in Kenosha, Utah, and I've had, a, had the international experience that I've had. But whatever you choose to do, I'm bumping that thing, whatever you choose to do in your life, as Shakespeare said, you know, whatever thou art, act well thy part. If you're going to be an engineer, be a good one. If you're going to be a farmer, be a good one. If you're going to be an English teacher, be the best one you can be. Excellence truly is about being the best you can be and picking something you really enjoy to do. So what I'd like to do here is tell you a little about, about the company I work for. Many of you may have heard about John Huntsman, youngest executive for Dow Chemical. Came along and said, hey, I don't want to work here at this big company, and you guys don't like your packaging business, so I'd like to buy it. And he started this packaging business and moved to California. He developed the first eggshell, or egg container made out of polystyrene. He developed a clamshell for McDonald's and Burger King back when they used to package those in polystyrene. And he got to a point where he couldn't get raw materials, so he went and bought an old, rusty chemical plant from Shell. And then he bought another plant over in England from Shell. And the British press came to him and said, Mr. Huntsman, why in the world would you buy such a rusty old piece of kit? And that's what they call chemical plants. And he looked at this guy and he said, because we make rust work. <laughs> and, and the guy said, sir, what, what do you mean, sir? And he said, he said, the people make the difference. He says you can buy a new kit or old kit, but it's the people that make these things work. Over my career, I've had a lot of experience to make rusty kit work, and I'll explain to you about that. Let me tell you a little bit about Huntsman. Huntsman is an $11 billion company. We used to be $15 billion. We sold off all our base chemicals. We have five divisions now. The division I was manufacturing vice president over made surfactants, which anything in a Walmart shelf that's soap, tied, that kind of stuff, we made all the raw materials for those soaps, industrial soaps and home use soaps. 
We also have, uh, uh, if you look at anything made out of fiberglass, cars, shower stalls, that kind of stuff, we make the raw materials for making fiberglass. We also make the raw materials for amine hardeners for epoxy and for polyurethane. To just give you an idea of what those are, we have a polyurethane division. That's our biggest division, about a $5 billion division. The seats you're sitting on have foam in them. It makes it kind of easier to sit there for an hour and listen to, to me. And uh, seats in your car, seats and foams in your home. And those are the flexible foams. And then we make rigid foams, which are the insulation on the outside of houses, big, thick, four-inch thick ones that go on the roofs of houses. And the, the polyurethane is used to glue wood together to make engineer wood products, so the oriented strand board, for example. We also make white pigment. Anything white that, that is white plastic, white paint, has a pigment in it called titanium dioxide, and we make that. We're the second largest producer in the world of that. We also make epoxies. The 787 Dreamliner is all glued together with epoxy and carbon fiber. We make the epoxy with the largest supplier to Boeing and for Airbus for those new planes, light planes made out of epoxy. We also make, uh, we have a very large line of epoxy hardeners and polyurethane hardeners called amines. They're ammonia-based chemistry that make your gasoline burn cleaner so it doesn't foul up your engine. And they use, and they cure the polyethylene and, and epoxies. So I've had a chance to work in several of those divisions, and now in my new role, I get to cover all of those things worldwide, all 80 sites, and I'm responsible for all the engineering systems and all the operational excellence for all those plants. And I get to work with site managers all over the world. India, China, Korea, Vietnam, Australia, and I've been to a lot of different places in my career. So the division I worked for last as manufacturing vice president is this one. We had a very good track record of earnings, and based on that performance, if you have good performance, you get to new, do new fun things. If you don't have good performance, you get sold, or you get told, go away. So fortunately, I've, I've had a lot of fun. The stuff that Huntsman used to be is on the bottom. We used to go buy old plants. We were a private company. John Huntsman said, why go buy a piece of land in England, spend a bunch of years building a plant, engineering a plant, three years to build it, go hire salesmen, start all over again from new, when I can go buy for 20 cents on the dollar a business that's already working that somebody else doesn't like anymore. And the trick is to turn it around and make, they couldn't make it make money, but we're going to make it make money. We bought four and a half billion dollars worth of assets from a company in England called ICI, Imperial Chemical Incorporated. And we went over there and I got sent, go fix it. Well, that place was losing $60 million a year. As you can imagine, you can't stay in business very long if you continue to lose $60 million a year. So Peter Huntsman came over and said, we're going to inject two vice presidents into this business. John, you got the commercial part. Go out and sell all this material. And Kevin Nino, you got the manufacturing. Go make it better. And within 20 months, we'd take that business to break even. And I'll tell you a few stories about that. It was pretty fun. One of the things we did is we did something called a bag brigade, which I learned when I worked for DuPont. I was trying to turn a business around. This old guy came to me and he said, John, your boss comes to you every month and he walks you around the plant and he shows you all the stuff that's wrong. And you write down this big list and then you got to go back and try to remember where those things are and try to fix them. He said, what we did in the Army is we would do, go out on the flight line and we'd have a bag. And if there was a cigarette butt or a piece of trash, we'd pick it up and we'd address it right then. We wouldn't write lists about it. We'd go take action and fix it. So I learned that, and so when I went to this plant in, in uh, England, I took all the people that worked for me who were all salespeople and all people who were working in commercial, and I told them, we're going to go to the plant. And they said, what do you mean we're going to go to the plant? I said, well, we're going to put on blue Tonys, and we're going to clean this place up. Because if I bring a customer here, they wouldn't buy one thing from us because this place looks so bad and smells so bad. So we were out in the plant cleaning up. So I had a guy come up to me, and he said, so, sir, you have a funny accent. What's your job? And I told him I was vice president of petrochemicals. He said, you've got to be kidding me. And I said, no. He said, I've never seen an ICI executive here ever in 30 years. And you're out here mucking out pump bases and carrying flanges and cleaning up and sweeping. I said, yes, I am. But I can't do that always because if I'm doing that, I'm not doing my job of selling. But I promise you, you clean this place up, we'll bring customers here, and we'll make some money. And we did. And you know, because of that business that was losing money so bad, they gave us a polyurethane business, a pigments business, and three of our most profitable businesses were given to us to help offset that money, money losing dog. Read these quotes for a second. My guys really laugh at the second one. I, I always tell them, hey, I have the simplest of taste. I'm always satisfied with the best. <laughs> to which they say, oh boy. <laughs> but my question is, as BYU students, as representatives from the Lord's University and representatives of Jesus Christ, what do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for mediocrity? 
Do you want to be known for getting by? Or do you want to be known for excellence? Because I promise you, even though we are not going to be perfect here on this earth, you strive to be excellent, you'll be, you'll be recognized for it. People will watch how you live your life. And that's not just excellence in making money. That's excellence in your moral character, in your ethics, in making the right decisions. What's right is not always popular, and what's popular is not always right. And sometimes when you get faced with hard decisions, you've got to decide, am I going to be excellent in what I do? Well, when I go in to try to turn these plants around, I get parachuted in. I get a call, and they say, John, we need it over in Italy tomorrow. We're getting ready to buy a business. We bought some 40 businesses over the last 30 years. And we've gone from a private company buying these things to building a lot more plants. But I get parachuted in to go fix something. One of the things I realized was when you get parachuted into a highly unionized environment and people are like, oh, you're management. You know, you, you can't tell us what to do. And I said, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to talk to you to find out how we can make this business better. I want your ideas. And I promise you, we'll implement your good ideas. Well, the last guys didn't. Well, test me. Try me. So one of the things I did is I, I worked on safety because nobody can say that it's okay to hurt people. It's not okay. And generally, when plants were losing money and not doing well, they would usually have higher injury rates and bad environmental performance. And so I compared you know, the culture change I was trying to drive to rattlesnakes, living with snakes. And I do some fun seminars where I pay people to do some unsafe things and stand on chairs and do all kinds of crazy things. But I would ask them, is it okay to stand on a chair? And they'd say, yeah, you can do that safely. Well, you do it 100 times, you may fall off. If you fall off, are you going to hit your head and not go home? Or are you just going to sprain your ankle? You get to choose the behavior, but you don't get to choose the consequence. I want all of you to say, because I do this with my safety classes, I want all of you to repeat three times, I get to choose the behavior. Say that, please. I get to choose the behavior. I do not get to choose the consequence. One more time. I get to choose my behavior. I don't get to choose the consequence. One more time. I get to choose the behavior. I do not get to choose the consequence. Why do we repeat things? Because repeating things is nothing different than burning a CD in your brain. You burn it there long enough, it's going to stay. You burn it with bad stuff, it'll, the bad stuff will stay in there. But I promise you, if you burn the good stuff, it'll stay there. My dad's repeating things all the time. He calls us every time he hangs up. Stay on the upward road, John. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Something he repeated to me, I don't know, can't, I don't know how many times growing up. Another one from James Allen's little book, As a Man Thinketh. Mind is the master power that molds and makes, and man is mind. And evermore he takes the tool of thought. And shaping what he wills brings forth a thousand joys, a thousand ills. He thinks in secret, and it comes to pass. Environment is but his looking glass. Your environment can be nasty. It can be rotten. But you don't have to let that stuff get inside you. If it does, that's what poisons you. All the poison, as long as it stays on the outside, not going to hurt you, and it will not change you. This... Boa constrictor was at a plant in uh, Malaysia, an Exxon Mobil plant. I have people send me rattlesnake and snake pictures from all over the world. I promise you, you get close enough to that snake, it's going to get you. And the consequence may not be pretty, <laughs> but the choice is, do you live with snakes? So the question is, your behaviors are things you can change immediately. You have absolute and total control over your behavior. You can't control your spouse, can't control your husband, can't control other people, but you can control yourself. If I decide I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, I don't want to be late, I don't want to have this, I can, dis I can change. And that's what Christ did for us, is give this agency, this wonderful plan to where we came here to learn. But if we don't learn, the snakes are going to get us, we pay a price. My dad used to always tell me, John, you don't listen, you got to feel. And it's true. <laughs> I felt some stuff sometimes, right, Dad? The defects... What do you think about that? Anybody want to be that parachute guy? <laughs> That's an at-risk behavior. I promise you, you may get out of there one time, you do it enough, those gators are going to get you. I like to ride motorcycles and four-wheelers on the sand dunes up at St. Anthony. You don't take care of your bikes and that wheel comes off, that landing can be pretty hard. This is a 99-pound rattlesnake at a gas plant in Texas. And I always tell people, if you're going to kill snakes in your own life, the snake may be in your head thinking, it's okay to violate commandments. It's okay to know all this church stuff, but I'm going to go off and do it my own way. But the Lord's told us, I am bound, literally bound, 
when you, when you do what I say. And if you do not what I say, you have no promise. He has to bless you. So you're either going to live with a snake and take some nasty consequence, or you're going to live with somebody that you trust. But in business, trust is what it's all about. If you have something happen in your life that doesn't feel good and there's pain, you get to repeat it. History always repeats itself if you don't understand why it happened so you can change the behaviors that led to that event. Sometimes in our industry, we have fires, we have explosions. Like BP had an event that killed 15 people due to an explosion. That event had happened six times over 10 years, and nobody did anything about it. Nobody drilled into it to find out that that vent release was happening again and again and again. And the last time it happened, they had a big vapor cloud release. It found a spark in a diesel truck, and it blew up and killed 50 people, 15 people and injured 150. So I developed a, a model, a balanced model, to help correct businesses. The one on the left talks about safety. It's about human life. It's not okay in our industry to poison anybody, to let people breathe things they shouldn't be breathing. It's not okay to let people get hurt, and it's not okay to have plants out of control. That is our license to operate. We don't do that well. We're out of business. On the right-hand side, though, I had plants that I took over that they wanted to sell them, and so they only focused on fixed costs. Get your cost down, get your cost down, get your cost down. And in the process, they ended up having plants that didn't run very well at all. So you want to focus on making money. Businesses that don't make money don't stay in business very long. But you can't do that in violation of values. So the one thing I want to tell you about is about a value framework. You, as members of this church, those of you who are, and I hope most of you in here are not, if you're not, I invite you to, to, to listen and to learn about it, have a value framework. And that value framework is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it will keep you out of big trouble. We have a very corrupt society. We have people who think it's okay to steal other people's money. It's okay to lie. It's okay to misrepresent house, housing contracts and things that they think are just okay. But they've destroyed our economy and being dishonest. And what we need to do is make sure that we, we live within our values. But here's, here comes the dichotomy. You have to have a value system, but the world's changing all the time. So how do you have a value system that's fixed in a world that's changing all the time. The same framework is in leadership. If you don't have good management in a plant that's running that plant tight and right and making sure people don't get hurt, they're the ones that manage it the same way every day. The leader, though, is over here changing those processes all the time because in business, if you don't change, you die. Those 40 businesses that we bought over 30 years, we bought them because the people that were running them couldn't figure out how to make money running them. And we would buy them, and within a year or two, we'd have them making money and we'd have them a lot safer and the people a lot happier. So I, wanted, I gave a, a keynote speech at a conference for Aspen Tech. How many of you in here are chemical engineers or maybe studying chemical engineering? Wow, there's a lot, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, chemical engineering back in the days when I was in my slide rule days was kind of done on paper with a slide rule. But you have some very, very powerful tools today from a company called Aspen Tech, which is a company out of Boston. And I've worked very closely with them over the last five years to help improve their product and to make it more integrated. Because even with the companies they bought, they were all standalone companies. Well, let, me, let me walk you through a presentation I gave at their conference about a year and a half ago that talks about what's changed. Now, look, check these numbers out. If you look at shale gas, anybody know what shale gas is? I'm going to show you a slide on it. But it's basically, uh, there's a very thick layer of material way deep in the ground called shale. And if you drill down into it, you can get a tiny amount of gas out of it. But there's a guy named George Mitchell who developed the woodlands where I lived who figured out that instead of going straight through this way, he would come down and drill horizontally for about a mile. He would inject a lot of water in there, fracture all that shale, and then put little marbles and BBs and beads in there so the fractures wouldn't seal back off and the natural gas just came running out. Do you know that back in as far as 2007, we were running out of natural gas? And the natural gas prices in this country were freaking out. And everybody was saying chemical business is toast in America. Well, let me show you what's happened. Wind turbines. Anybody seen wind turbine blades here in Utah? Got a few of them around, right? Huntsman's got an 80% market share in the, in the chemicals for wind turbine blades. We're the biggest guys in wind turbine blades. And they're great, but they only can provide about 6% of our power. What about computing power? You heard my story about computers. There weren't any. You know that my very first IBM PC computer, which had a monochrome green screen, six engineers were fighting over getting some time on it. There was a guy named Merrill Beckstead that was a, called, they called him the rocket man, that was a chemical engineer that used to design the solid rocket propellant for the, for the shuttle system. And he would do chemical engineering calculations that would hit the mainframe computer at midnight, 
And if you didn't have your program run by then, you were toast because his programs would run CPU time for three hours. That's the world. You guys can get on the internet today. Internet before when I was here, it was, a, it was owned by the government. There was no internet. You couldn't jump on and look at Wikipedia and look something up at the tip of your fingertips. None of that stuff was around. But now we, in engineering, we've gone from paper-based systems to 2D systems, now to 3D systems. I can design a 3D model and walk through the plant like I'm right there. That's how the world's changed. So let me tell you about what experience I had moving to England. When I took over that role there, I inherited an oil position of $9 oil, $9 per barrel. What is the oil price today? Anybody know? In the $80, $90. Do you know the equivalent oil that's coming out with this shale gas? is $18 oil. Do you know that our country in the U.S. over the last five years has gone from $147 oil, depending on OPEC and the guys in, middle or in Saudi Arabia, to where the oil that's coming off with all the shale gas is $18 oil. It is absolutely revolutionizing the opportunities for chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, civil engineers, and all the kind of engineers you may want to have in this room, and some for our industry. There's enough natural gas now to supply our industry for more than 100 years. You don't have to worry about running out of energy in America, and there's huge opportunity here. But the oil prices are going to stay high. Why? Because, and I've had a lot of guys ask me this that you know, know I'm in the chemical business, they say, why are our oil prices so high? I said, well, let me show you some pictures of why they're high. We're using record oil all the time. It just keeps going up and up. There's been no change in that slope as far as record oil. Some 80, uh, 80 billion, 88 billion, or a million barrels per day. This is the natural gas prices. We pay at one of our largest facilities in Texas $10 million per month for natural gas when it was a dollar per million BTU. Back when there was a lot of crazy things going on with natural gas in 2007 and earlier, our natural gas bill went to $100 million a month. And $500 million got sucked out of our business in six months, almost took us to the wall. And we were able to save our company 10 years ago, and we're often much stronger now, but we've had to reduce our natural gas use. And fortunately, natural gas prices have come down. So let me talk to you a little bit about innovation. This is, this is fracking, horizontal drilling. You go down, instead of going straight down and perforating right in that small zone, you go about a mile off into that shale, pump it up with the hydraulic pressure, you fracture the rock, you put little beads and sand in there to keep the rock from forming back, and here comes all this gas and oil out of, this, out of these things. It's all over the U.S. And these red marks on this graph are where there's shale. We've got plenty of energy. We just got to make sure that we get it out of the ground in the right way and don't mess up. So here's the world I used to be involved in, computer cards, punch cards, 30 years ago when I was a student here. And these smart guys in, in Boston developed planning tools. And as we offer mainframes, and we now have uh, PC computers and powerful tools in your hands. Your phone is more powerful than most computers we had back then. But now uh, companies like Aspen Tech have software for engineering, manufacturing, supply chain. It's all integrated. It makes our life much easier. And now, by way of these two little disks right here, you load these things up. I don't have to spend, if I want to design a new distillation column for a chemical engineer, I used to have to go get VLE data, vapor liquid equilibrium data for all the components in there. It would take days or weeks to find all that information. And now you can get it in minutes off those two, those two CDs. So let me show you here. I'm designing a column. I can get VLE data, and if I design it a certain way, uh, I can have a certain cost on it. Just a difference in the VLE data can result in uh, $18 million difference in this column. And that's how important it is to chemical companies to have you guys come with your new tools and be able to say, hey, John, let me show some of these engineers that learned a different way. The engineers that are from my generation, they've had to learn these tools after the fact. I went on my mission in Taiwan, and still can speak a bit of rusted Chinese. Anybody in here speak Chinese? Okay, I'm going to throw something at you. Here's a Chinese speaker over here. This is going to sound really bad, but you can maybe tell them what it says. That's a little saying I learned when I first went to Taiwan. And it basically said there's an old lady riding on a cart, a three-wheel cart, and there's a guy pulling it. When they get to where they're going, the lady asks for 50 cents, or the guy asks for 50 cents, and the lady gives him a dollar. And they say, do you think that's strange or not? It's this nice way the Chinese find out whether or not you're benevolent or whether you're cheap. They're real sneaky that way. They're smart. <laughs> They're wonderful people. When I was working in China, when I went back uh, nearly 12 years from the time I was there before, this area right here, when I was there 
in 1987 was rice paddies. And today it looks like New York City. That tallest building there is 101 stories tall. And this is one of many, many, many Chinese cities that look like this. If you are, make some money in China, and they're making a lot more now than they used to, they have a middle class that has a lot more buying power, you can't go buy a standalone home because they don't have as much area in the, uh, in the fertile areas where they can have a standalone home, but you can buy a nice apartment. But the one thing you can buy if you've got money is cars. And they are buying a lot of cars. They're knocking down buildings, building wider streets, and they're building freeways everywhere. They're the ones that are pulling on all this oil. Their economy has grown at 10 to 12 percent. They're now at 7 percent now when we're down at 1 to 2 percent. They've had powerful, powerful growth. So engineering, why do people stay away from engineering? It's too hard. And this little thing, you can't read it right here, but what it says is one in 20 people in the U.S. study engineering, whereas in China and India, they've got nearly 10 times that. Why are the people not going into this? It's hard. It is hard. It takes a long time. It took me five years, and I was almost 28 years by the time I got out. And I thought, man, all my buddies, they didn't go on missions. They didn't have to work their way through school. They got out. They're doing a great job. But you know what? The things you're learning on a mission, the things you're learning here, will pay off far more than just the technical smarts that you've got. Will you have a job? A lot of small print here, but basically this says billions and billions of dollars being invested here in America and elsewhere because of shale oil. We've got cheaper energy than any other country in the world now. I was down visiting Chevron in downtown Houston. They're a $300 billion company. They're spending $60 billion in capital next year on plants around the world. There's plenty of jobs. You guys get your engineering degree, get a, do a good job, you're going to have a job. Whoops, I just messed up. This little thing says here, innovation being hungry, out of a quarter of all the U.S. startups, more than half of those in Silicon Valley were started by immigrants from 1995 to 2005. Is that because those immigrants are smarter than you? It's because they're hungry. They want to come here and make a difference. And if we're out and we're hungry, we can make a difference too. So one of the things I've been doing within my company is trying to get one version of the truth in engineering. We've got 40 companies that we bought. Every plant that I go to has got a different engineering system. So I'm working on trying to homogenize and make one engineering system one project approval system, one core engineering standards for our whole company. That's my job. Here's a plant that I worked on that was the single biggest challenge I've had my whole career. I took this on back in 2006. That plant was sending 63 people to the hospital every year. That plant had 117 environmental releases. And I got told by my boss, go camp out there and tell us better, John. So I left my dear wife and I went over and lived five months and took a team of engineers to this plant. And I spent a huge amount of time out in the field talking to the 11 unions that were out there who were like, you're not going to make this better. And I said, well, if you don't make it better, we get to shut the door. We get to go home. Is that what you want? I can find myself another job in a minute. Can you? And I would just ask him the question. So my question to you is this. Do you know how to talk to people of all different kinds of levels? Have you had jobs where maybe you worked in the oil field, maybe you worked in a restaurant? It's the people that make the difference. This plant today is the most profitable plant in all of Huntsman after six years of any of the plants by twofold. This plant's one of the safest plants. And it was work I did with a team that I took in there to help make it better. And it was all people-based. It was helping people recognize, if you want to think here, you're going to perform here. My challenge to, to you is think here. Because the prior management used to go in there and say, if you don't fix this place, we're going to shut you down or sell you. And it was real motivating. I went and asked him, who do you want to work for? If it's Huntsman, if we're making money, I don't mind asking for some of it back. And if you're making money, you are not going to get sold. And if you're safe, you're not going to get sold. Nobody's talking about selling this plant now, but I got to study shutting it down five times. But today, it's smoking, and it's making money. And it's the reason I have my new job. It's the reason I get to go out and do some other things. But I'm going to tell you this. There were people that asked me to do dishonest things to make that plant better. I said, no, it's not going to take dishonest things to make this plan better. It's going to take the people who work here to believe that they can make it better. Not because I'm telling them it's better, but because they believe they can make it better. So I've got a little slide at the very end. I'm going to go through a couple of things to show you. Things that back up these principles that you have on your website for the Weedman Center. These principles are true. If I were going to develop a list for 32 years working in the chemical industry, it would be no different than this list right here. If you don't have honesty and integrity, if you can't be trusted, 
You can't be loved. You can't have a marriage. You can't have a relationship with a friend. And you will not have a successful business career. You can make some short-term money by being dishonest, but if you're not trusted, you need to go home. And secondly, if you're making wise decisions, those are decisions that are best for the company, not what's best for you, and put money in your pocket, you're going to be better off. And being a problem solver, I've used my why drill. I get people ask me all the time, why are you down here digging into problems? You're a vice president. I said, yes, I am. But I was a darn good engineer before I got to be a vice president. And if you don't understand the problems, they don't go away. And you get to live with them over and over again. We were lucky last time. We may not be lucky in the future. And being a team player is really important. I had a guy when I first went to work that assigned me to be with a guy to sniff valves for vital chloride in a plant. And the guy they assigned me to work with was the meanest, crustiest, nastiest maintenance guy you could ever imagine. He's chewed tobacco. He has a really foul mouth. He's spitting on my feet all the time. And when I thought about going out to work with this guy, I thought, it's going to be a long two weeks, <laughs> a really long two weeks. So I thought, what can I do to maybe get this guy off to a different way of looking at life? And so I asked him the question when the curse came out. I said, did you bring your salt and pepper? And he said, boy, what you talking about? This is in Mississippi. And I said, well, I heard you have this reputation for spitting there, there chewing up engineers' heads and spitting them out. So I thought if you had some salt and pepper, at least it might taste better. <laughs> He's like, yeah. He got this tiny little grin on this side of his mouth. And he goes, well, boy, that's kind of funny. <laughs> and, <he's, laughs> and, he and he spit at my feet and almost hit my boots. But the whole time we were out working, sniffing, we were having the ball. And we'd come back to the control room. He'd treat me like an idiot just so he could keep up his image. But I got to know him. And he was a great guy. I've also watched a guy named Paul, who was the smartest MIT engineer, chemical engineer that I have ever met in my life, came to a plant that I was operations manager at in Texas, had a problem all night long. This guy fought this column, big, massive football player named Eddie, and he was sitting there working. Paul comes up to him and says, hey, can you help me? Or Eddie says, can you help me with this problem? And Paul looked at him and seriously said, yeah, I could probably help you, but I don't think you'd understand it. And Paul just walked away, and Eddie sat there and goes, I'm going to kill that guy, I'm going to kill him. I saw other engineers who weren't near as bright as Paul that came and treated people with respect, and the engineers would get reams of paper and hand them to me, hand them to me and hand them to others. That's the difference in teamwork. And finally, in the global world, I deal with every kind of culture you can imagine. I go to Australia, and I come and say, God, I made it. You want to put some shrimp on the bobby? I go to India. I come home with this accent in my head. I had a guy tell me on these dangerous roads, Mr. Prouse, you look rather uncomfortable with these streets. Maybe you better lay your head down and go to sleep for a little while. <laughs> then I go to England, think I'm speaking English. My wife and I are over there, and I've put my foot in my mouth more times, you know, trying to speak English, English. There's a wonderful world out there. I have a massive love for the Chinese people. They're smart. They're way dedicated. They have a word called shinku. And shinku in Chinese means hardworking. Stay at it, stay at it, stay at it until you get it done. And they do. Let me finish with these things right here. You don't have honesty and integrity. You can win for a while, but you will lose in the end. In the scriptures, it tells us in Proverbs that if we don't cover our sins, in fact, if we do cover our sins, we will not prosper. And if we repent of our sins and confess them and forsake them, we will have mercy. I promise you that there is a Lord that looks over all of us, that watches over the good and bad we do. And if we try to do the right things, even though we're not perfect at it, he will prosper you. He has prospered me and prospered my family. And things have to be based on a spiritual foundation because if they're not, you will not be able to get to people's hearts. And it's the hearts and the minds, the creativity and the commitment that comes from people that truly get treated from a spiritual standpoint that will help you win. You must have strong values. If you look at leadership, leaders are always driving change. Guys, when they see me show up, they go, oh, not you again, because I'm driving change. But until we drive the change, they have to manage well. But I'm always asking, how can you do that better? What's, what, how can we make it better? To get a chemical engineering degree, to get any engineering degree, to finish BYU, period, it takes dogged determination. I flunked an organic chemistry class because I had three jobs I was working trying to make money for my family, and I thought, I'm done. If I don't have organic chemistry, I mean, how can I be a chemical engineer? And I came back, and I took it during spring break, and it came at me twice as fast, and it was really hard. But I got through it, and I went on, and I finished so if you ever fall, you're going to stand up. If you make a mistake, repent, stand up, go on. The only way to truly fail in life is to lay down and just wallow in your sorrows. You are going to make mistakes. We're here to learn. You have to listen to learn. We can never stop learning. 
It takes management courage to be able to speak the truth when it's hard. Go see, go to the plant, actually be with the people. Go listen to people you work with. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Serve, be an advocate, do the why drills. And finally, sometimes you're gonna feel like you drink from a fire hose. You're learning how to learn right now, and I promise you when you get out of school and they put you in a brand new plant and you don't know a darn thing about it, you're gonna start all over again. But you're gonna go, hey, I passed BYU, I can do this stuff. <laughs> and finally, love for all people. The Lord truly loves us, and therefore he forgives us our shortcomings. He forgives the things that we fall short of, and we must do the same. There's not a perfect person you're going to work with that's going to be a perfect person, including yourself. But every single time I point a finger at someone, I've got three fingers that point at me, back at me as a manager because I control the pace, I control the money, I control the speed, and I can find a human to blame every time. Human beings are the root cause of all accidents, injuries, and failures or successes in life. We are human. And if we truly work on learning how to be better humans, learning to be more tolerant of all cultures, of all people, of all races, sexes, and people who have different ways of thinking in life than we do, we will be successful. By definition, we will. I'm thankful to be here. I want to close, because I can't, when I do this in speeches outside, by bearing my testimony, that I know there is a God. I know this stuff didn't come here by Big Bang. Any bang I've seen rips stuff apart. It doesn't make things more perfect. <laughs> and I know that families are forever, and I've got a great dad and mom who taught me well, my brothers and sisters. I've got a great wife, thankfully. And I'm thankful for that family plan. I'm thankful for this church, and I'm thankful for this school that I got to go to years ago, and I'm thankful to be here today. And I s close in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Well, I took a bit longer than I was supposed to, but uh, questions, anyone? Yes, Greg. I'll start with questions. Okay. Uh, with the students here, if you could, just take a moment and share the importance of uh, developing this leadership competence and how not only it applies initially in their career, but really what it does to make a difference as they go throughout their entire career. Okay, leader, leadership competence. For example, let's, let's ask the question, what is that? Leaders in an organization can drive change. Peter Huntsman used to always tell us, this business we've got is a super tanker. If you just let the rudder sit where it is, it's going to hit somewhere. Your job as executives in this company, we just had our two-day review yesterday and day before, is to make sure that ship ends up where you want it to be, not where it's going to go naturally. So the competencies of leadership to be able to develop those start right here. If you want to develop teamwork, work on projects. When my son was doing his MBA, he had some guys that weren't pulling their weight, and he was doing the work for them. And I asked the Spencer, question to Spencer, if you keep doing their work for them, they're going to let you. You need to let them fail. So he left. He did his work, and he left and went to Idaho to visit me. And he told the guys, if you don't do this, we're all going to fail. For our whole two years, two and a half years, is going to be wasted. But the accountability process of let, holding people accountable, whether it's kids or whether it's you know, people or students or uh, whether it's people in a work environment, they need to deliver their part. The leadership, the leadership accountability pieces are really about trying to make sure that when you learn a leadership principle, like I explained some of these to you, and you've heard other good talks, that you begin to apply them in your life now, not wait until you're out in industry. Don't wait until you're out with, faced with a tough choice about whether or not you're going to be honest. Those decisions about word of wisdom and honesty, you make those decisions way up front. When I'm in China and I get asked to drink, ganbe, 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 I got a guy getting after me. Why don't you like us Chinese? You're not ganbe and you're not drinking with us. And I just said, hey, I, I can't. And finally, this Chinese friend of mine said, Shri Gajau, wait a shirt thing. He said, it's a church thing. And the guy goes, oh, he left me alone. You, <laughs> you stand by your guns. People have respect for you. But you don't stand by them. They lose respect in a hurry. Thanks, Greg. Yes? Did you know you wanted to go into management when you were at BYU? No. I, t I did take a management option because I had some interest in that. I, my ultimate goal was kind of... Uh, to be a plant manager down the road, but I knew that I wanted to be an engineer to kind of prove out my engineering skills first. And that's the way it always works. Sometimes you'll get in technical, you'll really enjoy it. I was a good engineer, I worked hard at it. I got a patent uh, when I was early on in my uh, engineering career. But because I, the way I worked with people was the way that I got my chance to, be, to go into management. And when I got in there, when DuPont went through some downsizing, I got put back into engineering. And that's when I, in my career, I actually went into sales and marketing in China because, uh, and that gave me this opportunity to go. So it was five years into my career that I got to go into international.
But I, I didn't set out to say I'm going to be a manager. I, I set out to say I want to be a really good engineer, and if I get a chance to be a manager, I'd really like to try that. Because I, I really enjoy working with people. Other questions? Yes. Well, there, in, in Holland, there are uh, a lot of uh, natural gas driven cars right now, and they have a distribution center to do that, uh, or system to do that. The big drive in automotive right now, and we sell a lot of epoxies and other things into automotive, so we, we deal with those guys a lot, but the biggest drive right now is to go for electric cars. Just because once you generate electricity, you can plug anywhere in the grid, you know, you already have that distribution system built in. To be able to put in a natural gas distribution system and change all of our gas stations over to that, huge, huge money. So the big, the automotive companies right now are driving toward uh, electric, electric cars and hybrid cars and then eventually all electric. Because uh, once you get fusion and you can generate electricity or once you have natural gas to drive power plants, you have your grid that can distribute electricity quite well. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for automotive engineers. Anybody else? No word. Yes. Okay, I let my wife come up and answer that question. <laughs> my 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 wife is from Germany, and I met her at a trade show over there. I was getting an orange juice one day, and happened to look up and saw these big green eyes and and blonde hair, and I thought, wow, <laughs> I was quite taken by her. And she eventually came to a visit to the United States, and about uh, seven or eight months later, we were married. She has been extremely hungry to learn English. You talk to her now, you can tell she has a very slight accent, but she speaks English very well. In fact, better than some Texans do, because she corrects their grammar. <laughs> she corrects their grammar all the time. But when, when you're hungry, what hungry means is you're hungry to learn and you're hungry to be able to show what you can do. I, my son, who lives in the woodlands, my youngest son, I've got a 34-year-old with four kids, a 29-year-old with two kids who is a Marine, and uh, you know, thought I want to be a Marine and a tough guy, and now he's back in engineering school. The oldest one's got three degrees, and he's off and running. He's had a very successful career so far. And here's this 18-year-old guy looking at, okay, so which brother do I want to follow? And I keep asking, Greg, are you hungry? Are you gonna sit here in the woodlands and look at this place and everybody had drives new cars? Well, you know why they drive new cars? Because most of the people here are educated. You don't have to have an education to make a lot of money, but you do have to be hungry. And money does not make happiness. Money provides opportunities for you. But in my, in my career, I didn't work for the money. I worked because I had fun. I wanted to be recognized for the things that I did, and the money came. So being hungry means I want to make a difference. When you leave your career, what are you going to be known for? Well, I'm going to be known for being a rattlesnake guy. I'm going to be known for driving safety improvement, saving, pe saving people's lives. And what I want to do in the engineering arena is make sure that I leave an engineering system in Huntsman that makes engineers' lives easier. That's my, my hunger. In my 50, I'm 59 years old, still got another five, six years to work. Anybody else? Well, I thank you for the time. I really appreciate being here.